When the global financial crisis hit, the stock markets drugged silver and gold down with them temporarily for a short period of time. They bounced right out of it. The stock markets didn't start rising until many months later. It was uh, the, the March of 2009 that the stock markets finally bottomed. How long can silver stay cheap? And the miners share a clue. And this is based on an analysis done by a bank of the primary silver producers and how much free ca cash flow they're going to generate this year, 2022. Uh, and the bank's uh, analysis uh, is that uh, they're not really generating that much. Therefore, silver has a floor under it. Now, I saw something. This was very similar to when I wrote my book back in uh, 2005, 6, and 7. I was writing my book, and the cost of uh, digging up the silver and getting that uh, poured into a bar was uh, approaching the value of that bar. So the, uh, I said in my book that, you know, where can you find an investment that has a floor under it that is so close to the current price? And we're back in that same position all these years later. We're back to where uh, the, the price of silver is very close to the cost of digging up silver. And so it can't stay there forever. And there's one more big setup right now that we'll get to toward the end of this article. Uh, so uh, he first he wants to set the stage and silver is a tiny, tiny market. So at $20 uh, per ounce, that roughly the, the entire estimated supply this year is worth about 20 billion. Uh, Starbu the, the market cap uh, of Starbucks is 112 billion or about five and a half times the entire silver supply of this strategic metal. And the world cannot get by without silver. It's not possible, especially as we move into a uh, more and more of a technological society. Solar panels have quite a bit of silver in them and such. And so um, a, a modern, clean, green, efficient world can't happen without silver. And so the primary silver market is also small. Primary is those are the guys that are out there. Their mission is to dig up silver and sell silver. And uh, roughly 75% comes from non-silver mines. So these are copper, tin, lead, zinc uh, mines and gold mines where silver is a byproduct. They're not looking for silver. They're not trying to dig up silver but about four out of every, uh, three out of every four ounces of silver that come to market, three of them come from a non-primary producer. So somebody that is mining copper or zinc or something like that. This is very important for the point that I'm going to get to toward the end of this. Uh, then he looks at the size of the market cap of the companies that produce primary silver producers and these are diversified miners that uh, are producing something else. Some of them may have a byproduct of silver. But you look at this. Here's gold. Here's silver over here. And silver <clears throat> is about one less than a tenth of what gold uh, market cap is. So the diversified miners uh, is uh, 441 billion. Gold is 225. Silver is 118 a little bit more than uranium. And I think of uranium as, you know, it's, that's uh, a mite on a flea on a dog. <laughs> you know, it is a, a tiny, tiny uh, market cap. So uh, the primary silver producers have a market cap of $21.9 billion. Apple has cash of $179 billion. So Apple can buy all of the primary silver producers more than eight times over with their cash on hand. And that shows you uh, how small this sector really is. And that smallness means that it can't 
uh, withstand very much capital flowing into it. If it does, it just explodes. Uh, so um, when you take a look at the uh, the cost of the all-in cost of production, and uh, then you take a look at the free cash flow, the free cash flow here of all of these silver producers, they're almost all in the minus, and then the couple that are producing a little bit of free cash flow per share uh, is very small. So this is how much ca how many dollars of cash flow they produce per share. And one of the largest uh, miners here of, of silver <laughs> is minus one dollar per share <clears throat> that they, you know, so they're going backwards, meaning, that they either have to cut back on production, they have to do high grading where they focus on just like the, the core of the vein, the highest grades, instead of getting all of the silver, which means uh, all of the silver that they're skipping while they're focusing on that uh, core vein uh, is very, very low grade and not worth going back to until you have silver that is, is priced in many, many multiples of what it is currently. And so what you're going to see is something playing out. Uh, all of those uh, non-primary uh, silver producers, the ones that are digging up copper, uh, lead, tin, zinc, now all of those metals, the demand for those metals is for uh, copper plumbing pipe in housing, uh, copper wiring in housing, castings for, for automobiles, uh, lead acid batteries. That's the, uh, the, the uh, secondary silver producers, the non-primary silver producers. They're digging up those other metals. Now, uh, right now, uh, demand for, ever since the pandemic, actually, demand for housing has fallen. And in, in like China, uh, there's this, this, this enormous housing bubble that is popping. But right now, I, I think they are in for the greatest real estate crisis in world history. But what you see here in this chart that I made on stock charts just now, this blue square is very similar to what we're going through today. My book came out right here, and I had said that silver has this floor under it. It can't go down and stay down. And what we had was the uh, market crash of 08, when the global financial crisis hit, the stock markets drug silver and gold down with them temporarily for a short period of time. They bounced right out of it. The stock markets didn't start rising until many months later. It was uh, the, uh, March of 2009 that the stock markets finally bottomed. Uh, the metals turned around and started rising before then, and a shortage developed in the metals. This is the spot price uh, for futures contracts. If you were trying to buy 100 ounce bars, they were still way up here. If you were trying to buy uh, silver eagles, they were way up here while silver was down uh, here below 10 bucks. But it came back up to the cost of mining and sort of started staying there. But at the same time, demand for new housing and new cars fell. There was, and, and so the demand for a uh, new supply of copper zinc, lead, tin, all of those things fell dramatically. And then suddenly the price exceeded its old high and it took off and we had this rise in multiples. Well, you look at what happened here and we had this pandemic crash that took silver into negative territory where it was below the primary silver producers, all in sustainable cost. And that cost has been rising due to inflation. You know, that cost was down in here somewhere, uh, and uh, it's, it has risen substantially due to inflation. Uh, we've had the price go up and, and sort of stabilize and then fall while we are seeing the, you know, real estate now is, is deflating in the United States. It's going in to go into a full-blown crash in China. So the demand for all of these primary metals is going to plummet. Uh, the automotive industry saw its peak in 2017, and the entire automotive industry, pretty much with the exception of Tesla, who grows at a, more than 50% per year, uh, the entire automotive industry 
hit its peak and has been falling pretty much since then. Uh, and so the demand for all of the castings for automobiles and for lead acid batteries is falling. Uh, so uh, we're in this same setup that was in this blue box here. And I think that within the next few years, uh, you should see silver exceed uh, these previous highs. And this time it'll exceed the $50 high from 1980. It was actually uh, $52.50 on the, um, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. 